After arriving at the beautiful Tall Katana Lodge, we made our reservations for Mahay's jet boat tour. Well worth the trip. Generally, anybody else got anybody in their party in the restrooms? Oh, All right, <laughs> we got three here. Um, I have a party of four with the name Alex. Morning. 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 Welcome aboard, guys. Morning. Morning. Sit there, that's fine. Alright, my name's Topher. I'll be driving you guys today. Uh, in the back there, we have Holly. Say hello, Holly! Hello, Holly! Hey. Wow, they actually like you this time. <laughs> awesome. So a little bit about the boat you guys are riding on today. This is the Talkeetna Queen. It is a 46 foot long, 13 and a half foot wide boat with three uh, four, uh, 494s in it. So you've got plenty of horsepower units with this river, a little over 1300. Uh, this river's flowing about 10 to 15 miles an hour, and it's quite frigid, anywhere from 38 to 40 degrees. So you would not want to go for a swim. But if you did go for a swim, uh, we have these nice little life jackets. <laughs> Look like this guy. So they got a nice little ring or a nice little uh, strap around it. Goes metal clips of the ring. Pull it tight. Slip it or slip it over your neck. Pull it tight. You're good to go. If you got it over your leg, you're doing. This is usually one of my favorite stops because there's usually a beautiful view of the Alaska Range. So. Right out of that window is usually what you'll see. I'm bringing this by. Um, we usually have a postcard, and I always make a joke that it's for sale, and somebody actually bought it. <laughs> so now I'm back to my phone. So what lies with a very short period of time? Um, the reason they have to come in that time frame before mid-April, it's really too cold on the mountain. Um, that's our that, that's our guys have been out there fogging the site for us. So, yeah. There are some not so tall cockroaches. Uh, the reason for that being is because the ice came through over the course of two years and it actually ripped apart most of those trees. Um, they just had really bad ice jams right here on this little channel to our right. And it just ended up decimating those trees, but it isn't all uh, in vain. It actually really. This was made out of foot push. I made it. These are the guys who are going to keep the mosquitoes off of us, so thank them. They also keep our trails clear. So, all right, so a couple of different things talking about these trails. Um, there's several plants out there that I want you to be aware of. Um, so that you don't go frolicking through the through the forest and get yourself into some trouble. Cow parsnip, devil's club, they both have a very broad leaf. Devil's club has a lot of thorns. It's, it's not the funnest mm. thing to mess with. I'll show you some of that when we get down the trail. Cow parsnip also has a very large leaf. Consider it kind of like lower 48 poison ivy, poison oak. It secretes a lotion on oil. If you get that on your skin, it can cause some severe burning. So um, with all that being careful. said, just be careful what you're... Uh, looking at and touching. 
Um, these boys fog out here every day so that we don't have to battle mosquitoes. Oh wow. So consider whether or not you want to eat anything on the trail, okay? We start to see some raspberries and there's a few other things that are edible. So they 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 do a really good job of fogging for us. So we appreciate it. So try not to eat any right. of this stuff. <laughs> okay, a couple of things we might see on the trail. I doubt today because the boys probably scared it off. Just see the porcupine? No, unfortunately. <coughs> we have porcupine, but we don't mind the porcupine. He's my friend. So we like him. But bears and moose we do not like. If we were to happen to see a bear on the trail today, or if you were to happen to see a bear on any of your excursions, um, you want to make sure you stay with your group. You want to make sure that you let the bear know that you're present. Um, that's usually all you have to do. Maybe wave your hands. Um, you definitely do not want to take off running unless you're offering yourself as a tribute to the group. We would, we, you know, we're like, we will think fondly of you in, 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 in your memory. Um, but most importantly, we need to kind of stick together. If we see a moose, it's a little bit different approach. We don't want to call out the moose's name. We don't want to wave at it. Um, we definitely don't want to get closer for a better picture. If we see a moose, which is more likely of the two things that we might see out here, um, we want to definitely be quiet, give the moose its space, and go the opposite direction. Mama moose have been dropping calves the last couple of weeks. You will never in your life meet a more threatening mama than mama moose. So we definitely don't want to aggravate her. Um, so the most important thing is if there were anything on the trail that you stay between me and that animal, um, I'm perfectly capable of taking care of it. Now, all that being said, the one thing these boys can't do for us is get the roots off the trail. There are a lot of roots. We are not in a big hurry. If you see something that you want to look at, I see cameras, I probably see binoculars if I get close enough. Um, you folks are the folks that usually face plant because you're trying to walk and take pictures or walk and look through your binoculars and we don't have to hurry. Just stop, look at whatever you want to look at and then you can catch back up. We don't walk very fast. But please pay attention to the roots. That's usually what the first aid kit comes out for. All right, anybody got any questions? Let's go down the trail. We're gonna have snacks when you get back, right? You got snacks for us? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just told him not to touch the leaves. You weren't listening. Uh, I'll, I'll go in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> here um, the same reason most of you started booing and awing and taking pictures these ferns are amazing here's the amazing part none of this was here four weeks ago nothing was here okay these grow at a very very rapid rate um, because we're nearing summer solstice so we're getting like 20 to 21 hours of daylight the three hours, if you guys wake up at like 2 a.m., you look outside, you're like, this is dark. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still like twilight. So when I say yeah. we get 21 hours of daylight, it's pretty much 24 seven right now. Mm -hmm. I could go out and easily walk through the woods at two o'clock in the morning with enough mm -hmm. daylight. So mm -hmm. uh, what you're yeah. seeing here is the result of all that daylight. Our vegetation grows at a very rapid rate. What you're looking at behind me, <clears throat> like I said, was not here about four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, we were still sitting on snow out here. So all of this vegetation is brand new. These fiddlehead ferns will grow at a rate of two to three inches a day. When they first come out of the ground, the ends of them are very tightly wound, which is how they get their name, fiddlehead ferns. Looks like the end of a fiddle. Um, once they uh, come out of the ground, they're really good to eat. Um, the ladies will come out here or all over town. They'll harvest them. They'll cut off just the little spiraling part. Um, saute them, you can pickle them, jar them, eat them fresh in a salad. Um, I, well, I always tell everybody they taste great, but I've only ever had them sauteed in butter and garlic. So, you know, you can put weeds in butter and garlic and it's going to taste okay. Um, I haven't been brave enough to eat them any other way. And we have some pickled fiddlehead fern at, at the office, but when I look at it, I'm like, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think I want to. So, I might get daring one time. 
uh, but they're beautiful plants. They're, these are mostly full grown, six to eight feet tall. It's about as tall as they'll get. Um, now you'll start to see as the weight of the ferns gets so heavy, they'll start falling over on each other. So mm -hmm. here in the next week or so, it's not gonna look nearly as beautiful because they all start falling over on each other. And at some point it looks like a herd of buffalo have been out here just lounging. So everything gets, they just, they turn into ground cover. Mm -hmm. So you'll see these broad leaves that I was telling you about when we, when we were at the trailhead. Cow parsnip over here. Um, this is what these broad leaves are. If you come over here, you'll see the Devil's Club. They look very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Devil's Club is, is a favorite in town. It's in the ginseng family. They harvest the roots um, and make a salve out of it. And that's great for joint pain and arthritis. You'll see several of our little shops sell it. Um, I've tried it. I feel an improvement you know, for a little bit of arthritis that I have. So it does have some effects. Um, the pink flowers that you're seeing everywhere right now, those are our wild roses. Um, they'll lose their, they'll lose the flower and, and, and produce a berry pretty soon. That is amazing. And then horsetail fern down here, it's great little ground cover. You'll start to see some of our raspberry bushes as we continue down to the, our fish camp. And bluebells, bluebells are blooming. They're blue. They look like a bell. Folks, <laughs> 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 you're going to have to figure it out from there, okay? Do you need forgive me nuts out here? No, we don't. Okay. Yeah, so we got to go a little bit more south. Yeah. Those are blue yeah, bells if we south. have those fall and winter months, uh, they would typically leave these regions and move into more coastal regions in the winters. Um, the Chugach and the Talkeetna Mountains. Um, and this would have been um, some of the things that they would have hunted. Now, I always bring up this point why they fished all summer. Fishing here was a guaranteed food source. Our salmon will spawn every year within a matter of days. We can to tell you what rivers they're coming up, what streams they're going to, what species of salmon we are expected to see. So when the Denina natives came up here to fish, they knew it was guaranteed food. When they go into the mountains to hunt, Nothing's guaranteed. You could walk for days and never see an animal. Um, so this was always to supplement their summer diet of fish. Um, so what they would do in the summer months, they would make their way up to their summer camps. This is very similar to what they would have had set up. These would be right here on the banks of the rivers near one of the tributaries that we're gonna take you to after we leave this site. Um, they would set up camp near these tributaries because they knew the salmon would be up in there um, soon. Once the salmon showed up, they would start fishing. When they're out there fishing in the tributaries, it's not like they were casting a line and reeling in. They were either using nets that they had made, usually from the roots of trees, or simply just walking into the creeks and picking up fish. These are very small tributaries. Back home, we call them creeks, okay? I'm supposed to use fancy words like tributaries, so that's what I'm doing. But they were creeks. They basically just had to walk in there and they could pick up the fish. The fish are spawning by the thousands. Once they would fill up their canoes, they would bring them back to camp. They're gonna cut the heads off of these fish. They're gonna slice them belly to tail, and they're gonna hang those slices of meat on a drying rack. Once the fish have been dried or smoked, they'll have a really smoky fire, keeps the bugs off. They didn't have talent out here um, spraying for them, so they had to come up with their own technique. But once they would get the fish to dry, they would store them in this ground cache. This ground cache is going to help protect the fish. It's also just a place to keep them um, so that they could do this all summer long. They're going to layer this hole with a series of sticks. Helps for drainage and then layering those fish and those sticks until they get to the top. They're going to cover them with logs, fiddlehead ferns, sticks, branches, anything they could to try and keep out little pesky critters. We've got a pretty good sized group today. This is about the size of a normal tribe. Not everybody would leave the camp. So there was always, there was always tribe members here to protect these caches. Um, usually they were protecting it from smaller critters, fox, coyotes. Bears are in the rivers. Bears know where their food source is and it's not in a camp full of stinky people. It's on the river. So bears were not that much of a problem. Behind us over here are their summer housing. This is called a lean-to. You'll notice the logs at the top are burned. They didn't have cutting tools, so they had to burn the logs to the length that they needed. On top of the logs, you're gonna see um, everything from twigs to, to grass, to leaves, uh, moss, anything that's gonna kind of be a filler between the logs. And then they would peel bark off of the uh, bark, uh, birch trees. 
to uh, kind of make a shingle. It's really waterproof. And then they're gonna put living plants on top of that. The roots would intertwine and clock everything in. The roots would also help absorb moisture. So it really made for a great roof system. Um, it works so well that when we get up to the trapper's cabin, you'll see that we copied it. So um, it's a really good use of uh, mother nature's supplies. We didn't have Lowe's and Home Depot's to go get our timber from. So we had to make do with nature. Um, you'll see on the ground we have some caribou hides. Um, they hunted caribou in the fall and winter. Caribou hides are really light but really warm, also very waterproof. And then some black bear hides. Um, you know, if they had the opportunity, they were not immune to taking a bear or two. And then back behind you, if everybody looks behind you, that is called a deadfall. So the other thing that they would trap or hunt in the summer months were beavers. Beavers are plentiful in these rivers. They would set these up all along the riverbanks. I'm, I'm sure some of you are have a memory of the Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner <laughs> yeah. episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm always thinking like, poor Wiley e. Coyote, he was never successful with all his traps and that looks just like one of his traps. <laughs> well, I don't see how that was any very successful, but it was. Um, but beavers love cottonwood and that small stick holding up the log is about the size of cottonwood that they would like to snack on. So that would be considered the bait. Um, and as the beaver goes over there and starts chewing on that, eventually it's going to get weak and break. And hopefully for the natives, that beaver is uh, in the wrong spot at the right time and the log would fall. And this is where the Disney story. Um, the pelts are there for you to check out, enjoy, pick up, pet. Don't put in your pocket. Oh, look at the room. Yeah. That's a classic song. Yeah. And that room's been up there for five years. Look at how long are they? What's that? What about these pelts? Um, they're a collection of river otter, uh, beaver, coyote. You look so cute. <laughs> Uh, Pine Martin, we have a lynx, fox, we have a red fox, we have a piece of a moose hide. Just a really good representation of various animals that are that we trap in this room. I'll go over a couple of things first. Trapper's cabin, this is your standard trapper's cabin. Does not have any windows that lets heat out, lets critters in. The door's very short. That doesn't mean our trappers were hobbits. That just means they were trying to conserve the heat in the cabin, so short door, tall ceiling. Heat rises, you can figure that out. Classic, classic dirt floor in there. You have to step down so that a grown man can still stand up in there. So it looks like it would be too short for a standard six foot man, but a six foot man could actually stand up in that cabin because the ground is, uh, the floor is, is sunk in. Behind me, every boy's favorite tree house. This is like every boy's dream tree house. This is another version of a cache. This is where they would store pelts, store excess food, any valuables that they wanted to keep um, safe would be safer here than in here. Um, they're trying to keep it safe from other critter, from critters, not from other trappers. Um, they would take the ladder down. You'd have stove pipes that are gonna run the length of those legs. That keeps animals from crawling up into the cache. So the most common thing that hunters would hunt or trap on their trap line was a pine marten. Um, we've got fox, uh, coyotes, lynx, beavers, River otters, as you can imagine, they weren't trapping very many river otters and beavers in the dead of winter, um, but the rest of these, they were. Your typical trapper is gonna have several cabins. They're gonna run a trap line between the cabins. Like a farmer in the lower 48, the more land you have, the more product you can produce. So the longer their trap line, the more products they can trap. Also is gonna help ensure uh, the population of those animals. So you're not kind of over trapping a specific area. So when he's going between cabins, he's gonna be breaking a trail with his dog team. That trail is also gonna become a trail for the animals he's trapping. Um, they're gonna use the path of least resistance too, so he's gonna set his trap line right along the trail that he broke. When he gets to his cabin after running his trap line, the most important thing that he has to do is to get this cabin warm. This is not a luxurious accommodations for him to rest. This is for him to thaw out animals. These guys have been hanging on a trap for maybe a day. 
and it doesn't take long for these animals to freeze when it's minus 20. So once he gets to the cabin, he needs to get these animals thawed out. And it's not because he wants to start tanning the hide and stretching the hide and producing a beautiful pelt. He needs the meat from these animals. There was no DoorDash. There was no Costco to get your order. Um, there was no Pizza Hut or Cubbies down at the corner. This was dinner, not only for him, but for his dog team. If he's not feeding his dogs, he's not running his trap line. If he's not feeding himself, he's not running the trap line. So it was a very serious situation in the winter months. These animals were used for survival. The pelts were secondary. So once he had the cabin warmed up, these animals would thaw out. He could go ahead and skid out the animals, use that meat to feed him and his dogs. And then he could go through the process of skidding the hides and pulling the hides and tanning the hides and everything that he needed to do to get these ready for sale. Occasionally, a woman was doing in the summer months. Mm -hmm. What do you think most folks came to Alaska for in the early 1900s to mid 1900s? Gold, 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 gold. I always love it when somebody goes fishing. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> or tributaries that I was telling you about at the Denina um, site um, that the natives would have came to. This little creek right here gets a really good run of pink salmon and also silver salmon. Um, we do have an active bald eagle's nest right here in this tree. Sometimes we get our mommy or daddy bald eagle. Um, it's no accident that they pick their um, nest right here by this tributary. Um, they're waiting for dinner. So um, when these salmon start coming in, uh, the bald eagles will be kind of all over this place. So as you're looking, sometimes we can see them up there, sometimes we can't. But I really want to tell you about our salmon run. We do get all five species of Pacific run salmon. Our salmon season's underway right now, I'd say. Kings are making their way up. So we start with the king salmon, and then we're going to see the chums, and then we're going to see the sockeye, and then we're going to see the pinks, and then we're going to see the silver. So all five species of Pacific Run Salmon. They each will go into different tributaries. Now you might be wondering, how do they know which creek to go to? Well, it's the creek they were born in. So um, whenever they're born, um, they'll winter. They're bo I mean, uh, they're, the eggs are hat. I mean, hang on, back up, back up. Yeah. Eggs are laid right now. They're all coming up to spawn. And they'll stay in these little creeks. The eggs are gonna stay in these little creeks as they hatch. All the little fingerling or smoke will stay in these little creeks for one to two years maybe depending on the species the pinks don't stay that long the, the kings will stay a little bit longer and um, at a certain point they'll decide it's time for them to to move out into the open ocean they'll come out of these little creeks at this time right now of the year and they'll just basically get washed downstream down into the cook inlet down in the pacific ocean now what we have coming up the ocean right now are those fish after they've gotten mature about one to two years. Salmon can mature about seven years. 
five to seven years. Um, but once they've matured, something's going to click inside their head and they're going to realize that it's time for them to come home. They'll come back to their natal stream. So they know what stream to come back to because of their olfactory senses. They have a really, really keen sense of smell. So they'll basically smell their way all the way home. Each little creek has its own very specific mineral content. So they're, that is Peyton Reichardt again. That's my kid, her birthday was yesterday. And so she still thinks she's my favorite and she's FaceTiming me. So we're just gonna turn her off. She'll get mad, she'll get over. It's her both captains tells me like this and I love this. She's kind of like Goldilocks. She's looking for just the right size of rocks. So some rocks are gonna be a little too big, some are gonna be a little too small. She's finding, she's looking for just that right size of rock for her. So once she does that, she's gonna lay over on her side and she's gonna start to use her tail fin to make a depression in the ground. Once she's done that, she's gonna lay some of her eggs. The male salmon's gonna swim by and fertilize them. They're gonna swim upstream together and repeat that process. Here's the really, really cool thing about nature. They know that when they build that second nest, that everything that mama salmon kicks up is gonna float down and cover up that first nest. She does this so well that once she's deposited all of her eggs, she's gonna go up one more time and she's gonna build a fake nest just so she'll have that debris to kick up to cover up the last nest that has the eggs in it. So nature is like fascinating that animals instinctively know how to do that. Now here comes the sad part. Everybody gets the sad face when I tell you they're gonna spend the last days of their life, about 10, maybe a few more, maybe a little less, but they're gonna spend the last days of their life protecting that nest. They are terminal spawners, so they did come up into this stream to die. So don't be sad though, because it's the circle of life. I know everybody watched The Lion King. It's the circle of life. The salmon that come up into these rivers and come up into our streams, they provide so much for our ecosystem up here. Everybody, everybody benefits from the salmon spawning. So once those fish die, the bears are gonna come in and eat the carcasses, the fox, the coyotes, the scavenger birds. Sorry, bald eagles are scavenger birds. They will come down and they'll eat away at the carcasses. Eventually those carcasses are gonna get washed out. Once they hit the main rivers, other salmon smoke and fingerlings are gonna eat away at that flesh. Other year-round resident fish are gonna eat away at those flesh. We have Dolly Varden, uh, whitefish, burbot, um, rainbow trout. They're all feeding on those salmon carcasses. Even our moose will benefit from the salmon carcasses because once these salmon carcasses get washed up onto the banks, all of that material is gonna go back into the soil. It's very, very rich in nitrogen, nitrogen so it comes from the ocean. It's got all these extra minerals and nutrients in it that our little vegetation life loves, especially our willow trees that grow along the banks. And also, once the salmon start running, bears are no longer focusing on baby moose. So mama moose can rest easy knowing that the bears are fishing and not looking for their babies. Um, they've done studies where full-grown grizzly bears can take out as many as 25 moose, baby moose, in a spring. So mom can rest Diane. Um, yeah. Well, our maintenance guys are out there working on our dock. That's something they have to do pretty regularly as the water levels fluctuate. Um, oh, they have a big, big ramp in. Yeah, put the big ramp back in. So, yeah, they, they're constantly working on that as our water levels change. But we don't want to throw them a big wake to make their job any harder. <laughs>
At the conclusion of the jet boat tour, Mahays would either bring you back to the hotel or drop you off downtown. We chose to stay downtown and check out the cool little shops. Here we are at the, the Christmas store in the middle of July and my god, it looks like it's snowing out here. Clearly it's dogwood season. That stuff's kind of gets up in your nose and makes you sneeze and all. <laughs> Not my idea of a good time. But hey, it's kind of pretty, but it makes a heck of a mess.
After exploring the quaint little town of Talkeetna, we jumped back on the shuttle to go to the hotel and get to the train so we could head to Anchorage. <laughs>